At first blush, the Lincolns appear as ill-matched as sandpaper and silk. On closer examination, their admittedly turbulent marriage confirms the old adage that opposites attract. There are no photographs of the two together. Mary didn't want to be photographed with Abraham. Not, not for, it's, he was 6'4 and she was 5'1. He used to introduce the two of them as the long and the short of it. Um, she didn't laugh. <laughs> like a pair of high-spirited horses yoked in harness, they had to pull together if the coach of state was not to be upset. Mary's quick silver temper should not obscure the genuine love she felt for her husband, nor the pride she took in his accomplishments. Mary and the boys supplied a buffer against worldly rejection, but they never quenched Lincoln's thirst for distinction. What elevated him above mere political gamesmanship was the wedding of ambition to principle. The 1850s saw his coming of age. In October 1854, Lincoln told an audience, my ancient faith teaches me that all men are created equal. Slavery, he added, was a monstrous injustice, mocking the claims of American liberty, shaming all true friends of freedom. In his celebrated House Divided speech of June 16, 1858, Lincoln employed biblical language to warn that the United States could not long exist half slave and half free. Yet he was no abolitionist. What Lincoln wanted emphatically was to put slavery on the road to extinction, thereby proving to the doubters that the American experiment would outlive them all. In preparing to engage Stephen Douglas in a historic series of debates that fall, he sat down and scribbled out what may be the most profound soundbite in American history. This is what he wrote. It's a little piece of paper preserved at the Lincoln Library in Springfield that Lincoln sat down one day and just scratched out. As I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. This expresses my idea of democracy. Whatever differs from this, to the extent of the difference, is no democracy. Speaking in Chicago, Lincoln proposed to discard once and for all the talk of, quote, inferior people. But in downstate Illinois, where the prevailing attitude was much friendlier to slavery and more hostile to the black man, he denied ever favoring social or political equality between the races. Lincoln couldn't run that kind of campaign today. Forget television, the internet wouldn't allow it. The differences between what he said in Northern Illinois and what he said in Southern Illinois would become, can't you see the, 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 the campaign commercials, Lincoln's flip flops on slavery? The fact is Lincoln was a pragmatist with a moral core who was willing to adjust tactics and even strategy in order to attain his long-term objective. I claim not to have controlled events, he would say as president, but confess plainly that events have controlled me. That was probably one of the more honest statements ever uttered by an American president, relevant to many American presidents. Events might control Lincoln's actions, but there were many among his countrymen who chafed under his firm or heavy hand. Lincoln himself recognized as much when he wrote, quote, it has been a grave question whether any government not too strong for the liberties of its people can be strong enough to maintain its existence in emergencies. Think of that. Think of the relevance of those words to the headlines in today's papers. The American Civil War was in fact two wars. One, a conventional conflict played out on a thousand fields of battle. The other, an interior struggle for Lincoln's head and heart, waged through constitutional debates and the incessant clash between moral and military requirements. Together, these two wars illustrate Lincoln's legacy. After all, everyone knows that Abraham Lincoln preserved the Union and freed the slaves, right? Well, not exactly. Lincoln didn't preserve the Union, at least not the Union as it existed before 1861. Melted down in the blast furnace of war was the compact of sovereign states drawn up by the founders in the summer of 1787. In its place emerged a modern industrial power with a strong central government, a nation, instead of a confederation. On the other hand, Lincoln did free the slaves. He just didn't do it through his Emancipation Proclamation. 
We might personalize issues by looking at two men whom Lincoln would meet, as it were, coming and going. One man embodying a feudal culture in its death throes, the other looking forward to a racial democracy of which Lincoln himself was only dimly aware. Chief Justice Roger Tawney was yesterday's man. He was the chief sponsor of the Dred Scott decision that effectively nullified the black man's claim to American citizenship. Remember the Missouri Compromise in 1820 had uh, placed a northern limit on the extension of slavery. And uh, the Dred Scott decision in effect nullified the compromise and said to slave owners, you can take your slaves anywhere you want in the United States. You can take to any state, you can take them to any territory. They are property, they are not people. That, needless to say, did not sit well with a growing number of northerners and not just abolitionists. Lincoln embodied, if there was such a thing as the middle of the road on this position. He was appalled by slavery, he opposed slavery, he thought it was a great moral injustice, but he also was able to put himself in the shoes of Southerners. Remember Thomas Jefferson had said, we have a wolf by the ears. There were many Southerners who themselves were made uncomfortable, if not more than uncomfortable, by slavery, but they didn't know how to get rid of it. And what Lincoln wanted to do, the, the moderate position, if you will, was to put slavery, as I say, on the road to extinction. Months after Taney swore Lincoln into office in 1861, the two men were locked in a constitutional crisis within a crisis. This is what Lincoln said, I'm like a man so busy in lighting rooms in one end of his house that he can't stop to put out the fire burning in the other. With the Union crumbling and Washington itself facing a military threat, the untested president confronted dangers everywhere he looked. Desperate times called for desperate measures, which Lincoln was not afraid to resort to. So he asserted executive authority as no president before or since. He suspended such cherished constitutional guarantees as habeas corpus, the right of every American to a trial. His actions led critics then and historians since to speak of incipient dictatorship. Chief Justice Taney directed the president to release a Maryland secessionist, one of 13,000 people who were arrested under martial law. Lincoln refused. He justified his action under the doctrine of wartime necessity. Were Maryland's legislatures, a legislature permitted to meet, meet and to vote secession, Washington, capital of the disunited states, would find itself clenched between the jaws of the Maryland, Virginia nutcracker. Anticipating claims that reverberate through today's headlines, Lincoln said that unprecedented circumstances authorized him to temporarily suspend a single clause of the Constitution. The alternative, he argued, was to yield to men who would trash the entire document. This is Lincoln at his best. Listen to his explanation. Often a limb must be amputated to save a life, but a life is never wisely given to save a limb. In any event, Lincoln's sweeping claims of executive authority could never have been made, let alone accepted in the old pre-war union. That was gone. His confrontation with Chief Justice Taney is the Lincoln presidency in miniature, a medley of tactical improvisation and bedrock principle. It summarizes not only the historical example Lincoln set for his successors, but how he transformed the presidency. But if Tawney belonged to the old order, the former slave, Frederick Douglass, couldn't wait to bury the past. He was an equally impatient for black troops to be enrolled in Union armies. The mission of the war, said Douglass, was the liberation of the slaves, as well as the salvation of the Union. I reproached the North that they fought with one hand, while they might effectively fight with two, that they fought with the soft white hand, while they kept the black iron hand chained and helpless behind them. 